You're listening to Accents, a radio show for literature, art, and culture. I'm your host, Katerina Stoikova, and my guest today is poet Mark Harshman. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Katerina. And yourself? I'm doing great. It's wonderful to talk to you, and this is your first appearance on Accents. Yes, it is. And I've been wanting to invite you and to talk to you ever since I met you. And that was, what, November of last year at the Kentucky Book Fair. That's uh, right. Fate had it that we were next to one another. And, um, and I really uh, wanted to know more about you and your books and the kind of things you do, and not only for myself, but also for the people who listen to accents. And I'm going to read part of your bio from this book, Woman in Red Anorak, which is the winner of the Blue Lynx Prize for 2017. Born in Indiana, Mark Harshman received a bachelor's degree from Bethany College and advanced degrees from Yale Divinity School and the University of Pittsburgh. His poetry collection, Believe What You Can, was published in 2016 by West Virginia University Press and won the Weatherford Award from the Appalachian Studies Association. And um, Mark is currently Poet Laureate of West Virginia. Um, so what are you writing these days, Mark? I'm working on uh, a collection of new poems, uh, also working on a new children's book. Uh, as some of your listeners know, I also write children's books, and my 14th, 14th children's book about Frank Lloyd Wright's famous house, Falling Water, came out just a couple of years ago, co-written with my friend Anna Smucker. And, uh, so I've started a new book about an artist, uh, uh, a rather um, a very avant-garde artist named John Cage, uh, artist, composer, and all-around iconoclast. So it's a real challenge to write a children's book on someone that was so wild and crazy, but I'm enjoying, enjoying, the, pro enjoying the process. Well, let me ask you about this. How do you make your choice on what to be a adult book and what can be adjusted for children or does does the work make the choice for you i think the work makes the choice for me usually uh, i often tell people that in terms of my own uh, daily discipline you know people ask about writer's block often and i say i'm fortunate for myself sometimes i will hit a wall when i'm working in poetry and i just can't go any further and i'll set it aside and I'll pick up a children's book manuscript that I've been scribbling with, and somehow I'm able to do that. So I've always considered that that, that was a real um, blessing, if you will. Um, and they, and they're similar in a, in a in a striking way. I think a a children's picture book, and those are the kinds of children's books I write. You know, demand uh, that the writers say as much as they can with as few words as possible. A discipline not that dissimilar from what I do as a poet. Uh, they're both a kind of succinct form. You mentioned writer's block and juggling projects uh, or alternating between projects. Do you give yourself a break sometimes? Oh yeah. Um, in, the, in the day itself, I, 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 the temptation to give myself many breaks is real, but I try not to. But a break for me means going downstairs and making a cup of tea or coffee, uh, taking a walk in the neighborhood. I walk almost every day about a mile or two miles in the local cemetery, which isn't far away. Um, and I have a garden, and that's, as I've been saying to friends, especially during the pandemic, the garden becomes a kind of Zen practice for me, it just takes me out of my, my head and into a different place. I've noticed since I was a boy that if I'm in the garden or picking wild berries that afterwards I can close my eyes, for hours afterwards, if I close my eyes, I can just see the, the pods of peas or green beans, or I can see the shining black jewels of blackberries or black raspberries. And it's something very, good about that, I believe. 
another question that I have for you. And um, I would imagine that you teach creative writing um, workshops or classes. You teach? I teach irregularly, but I do have a series of workshops that I present. I actually taught children for over 20 years in a small three-room country school here in West Virginia. And the students were uh, fifth and sixth grade. And I taught every subject imaginable. I was at the, at the very uh, limit of my skills with, when it came to something like mathematics. I, occasionally I would have a child who I'm quite sure knew math better than I did, but I would do my best. But yes, I teach creative writing classes for adults. Um, I've been uh, privileged to have been invited to teach at the Heinemann Settlement, uh, the Heinemann Writers Workshop in the summer, both um, teaching children's books one summer and teaching poetry another summer. And there is a question that I ask all my guests who teach creative writing, and that is if there is what is the most important thing you teach your students of creative writing? If there is one thing you want them to remember uh, from your class or workshop, what is it? Oh, heavens. I think I betray myself as having taught children for so long. I keep it very simple. One, I don't think I could rank what's most important. I think I probably have a dozen most important themes, but the one on my head just now as you and I are talking, I would say, uh, not only is it important to write every day, but equally important is to simply read every day anything and everything that you can put your hands on, not just poetry. And if poetry, not certainly not just contemporary poetry, not poetry in American English, but poetry from around the world, uh, both British English, if you will, and, and poetry and translation. I am so fed by authors from other countries and other cultures that um, I simply can't put a price on it. Um, uh, but you can ask me about some of those later, perhaps. Um, but simply a, a discipline of intensive reading. Mm -hmm. um, and I think out of that, one something else happens that I do teach, and that is several of the little exercises that I will lead students through often involve some kind of imitation. And I think imitation is a very good thing. I don't think it's stealing. I don't think it's cheating. I think it's just like a good musician wants to know how to play as well as the finest musicians there are. You, you learn their moves, and then you begin to translate them into, their, into your own particular means of expression. And I think um, imitation of, of poets that one finds um, are persuasive and inspiring is a very good and healthy thing, especially for beginning writers. There is a question I don't ask every day, and I will, because it's so interesting to me. You have an advanced degree from Yale Divinity School what is it like to go to Divinity School? What do you study there? Yale Divinity School um, is not quite the same as going to a seminary in America, although there are similarities. I went to Yale in 1973. And I went there not to become a priest or a pastor. I went there because I had become terribly excited about the writings of Joseph Campbell and Iliade and other people like that, uh, the, the uh, studying ancient myths, ancient mythology. And I was terribly excited. And actually a divinity school offered a kind of umbrella under which I could study um, those, uh, those subjects. And that's why I was there. Uh, cur curiously, the one professor with whom I most wanted to study left partway through my uh, time at Yale. And at one point I found myself taking two semesters in the uh, study of the book of Deuteronomy from the Old Testament, which was tortuous for me, but I've, I've thought with hindsight, it did teach me how to do close reading, even though I did not enjoy the subject. Did that school change you in any way? Yes. 
it changed me. Um, I did not, mm -hmm. let me back up. It, it changed me in part simply because it was Yale. I, and I was playing way above my usual, I mean, it was such a challenge. I come from a small farm county where my, you know, I was born on a farm in Indiana, uh, left the farm when I was about 10, but I still lived in the country, did farm work in the summers, very small town nearby. I went from there to Bethany College in West Virginia, again, a tiny little town, a very small college, less than a thousand students. And suddenly I'm living in New Haven, Connecticut, on the East Coast of the United States, a huge city, this um, prestigious university. And you know what I was learning culturally was every bit as uh, life-changing as what I was learning in the classroom. And it's hard to disentangle it all. It was, it was um, I can't imagine a, a more intensive time in my life. At that same time, my brother, my younger brother, he was only 20, was dying back in the Midwest. So that complicated that whole period of time. I'd be uh, drawing, well, it was uh, a tumultuous time. I'm grateful for it, but I wouldn't want to have to live through it again. I, I had wonderful I teachers. I had wonderful teachers. Um, both in religion, I, I remember once um, drifting to the downtown campus and um, studying, uh, taking a, a, a class in contemporary poetry, or modern poetry, I should say. And uh, it was taught by Norman Holmes Pearson, who may be somewhat forgotten now, but he was the biographer for the mid-century poet H.D., and a real expert on, on Ezra Pound and Charles Olson, uh, the whole Black Mountain School of Poets. And uh, that single class was um, helped. While I was at Divinity School is when I began to decide that I wanted to only write poetry. And this class from Norman Holmes Pearson played a role in that decision. I wanted to take a few moments to talk about this book and uh, I don't know, you can read whatever you would like for us. Sure, I'm sure. hoping that you will read a couple of points from here too. Um, I think it's amazing. I think, uh, how long have you been writing? Uh, since all, <laughs> all my life, frankly. But seriously, I mean, I started publishing I think I've sent my first little poems off to little magazines in the early 70s when I was at Yale, in the mid 70s when I was at Yale. So basically what I wanna say is that this is a book, these are poems written by somebody who has been writing poetry for a long time. Somebody who has been proficient in writing poetry for a long time. And um, I, you know, poems that the book forces you to read it very slow and um, and I have to read it at least three times in order to start really sinking into it and then a couple more times in order to really understand and, and appreciate it and every with every read the poems reveal themselves to me so um, a lot of respect and admiration for you and your work um, Thank you. Uh, tell us about this book. How did you write it? Um, was it long? How did you se select all these people to write about? How do you see them? You know, it, there is a special kind of seeing. Maybe, maybe Divinity School taught you how to <laughs> see people in that way. <laughs> I, I don't know about that, but it's funny that book came together very quickly. I had just published uh, the book Believe What You Can with West Virginia University Press. Um, and, and so these, the first two collections, I had one previous full-length collection called Green, Silver, and Silent, published by um, uh, uh, a fine press in Ohio. And both of those previous collections had poems from over a period of 10, 15, 20 years Woman in Red Anorak, uh, those poems were 
within five years and, and more recent. So it, it was an unusual feeling to have them. I know that I've been reading a lot of the French poet Jean Follen, and uh, I can feel his presence in some of the poems. The Swedish poet Tomas Tranströmer as well was uh, much in my mind uh, during these days. And I usually mentioned a third poet, Lorene Niedeker, uh, and even though I don't write in that very short, broken, succinct line of hers, uh, somehow she gets inside my head and does something, and I think uh, her presence may be there as well. And the, the fourth influence, if you live where I do here in Wheeling, West Virginia, I am directly across the river from Martins Ferry, Ohio, the home of James Wright. And Wright, um, I simply can't escape him living where I do. And uh, so, would you like me to read something from Woman in Red Anorak? Uh, please read, uh, read for a few minutes. Uh, I'd love yes, for you to do that. I'll try to find it. Here, and this is rather at random. I hope that's okay. Um, it's a poem I often read at the end or near the end of uh, a reading, and it's called Violets, and I'm pretty sure it's in that volume. Um, and I think it shows some of those influences I was just talking about. And uh, I have in my notes here, if I was reading this at a public reading, that uh, Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground and the Smiths, various rock and roll bands uh, were floating through my head here. I don't know if you can tell or not. It's called Violets. The light falls green along the sloping hill with its meandering streams of purple. I try hard to be there by being here to make some things mean something. The TVs are coming on their erasure of so much I used to know. A friend has thrown all her dreams into the outhouse and wanders in circles in a small room on the edge of town. Another sits by a window translating conversations between Lincoln and Kennedy, adopting stray cats, the occasional man, spending weeks creating stories that might lead them all home. My watch circles inside a loop larger than I can imagine. There are memories hanging from its arms, piling up one on top of the other, trying to slow its inexorable tick. Who'd have thought they weighed so little? I cup a few of my smaller dreams in the palm of my hand, hold them up to the airy light I know by faith is destined to extinction. The violets have begun to sing now, a small drop of rain in each of their throats. You know, the trouble, Katerina, is I can't remember uh, which poems come from that book and which not, but I do have poems I will read. I think, I think this poem might be in there. And if not, it's okay, right? Absolutely. Read us <laughs> whatever if you like reading for us. It's a poem called Grandmother at the Dressmakers for Bonnie Thurston. And it's about... I'm seeing here the little town in Indiana where I grew up and I'm with my mother's mother, my grandmother Maloon. And she, I don't think I need to explain anything other than it's a uh, kind of ours poetica. Grandmother at the dressmakers. A bolt of heavy cobalt gabardine shot with silver and scarlet threads lay across the cutting table. It was July. The overhead fan threw slow shadows upon the patterned tin ceiling. The neckline of grandma's cotton house dress had grown dark with sweat. The street outside, Mulberry, was empty. It was that hot. Grandma, however, made lists and did not move from them. A few minutes, that's all. I didn't chafe too much at the familiar words, 
heard in the grocery at the neighbor's fence, though always my hand was tugging at her sleeve. Bored, yes, but content enough, able to wait for the promises. Lemonade, ice cream, cookies. It was to be an elbow's length longer than the yardstick. There was tracing paper, thimbles, tweezers, bodkins, and pinking shears with their intriguing teeth. I took it all in, bothering and circling the women with questions, anxious to know as much here as I did in the barnyard with father. It was not poetry, not yet, but it was life as I knew it, and I was keen to know it more, to keep gathering as I did berries and stamps and pebbles, to see what rarities might show up, sparkle and speak, muscled cloth, scissor slash, and how precision might be wedded to beauty, to be the kind of gatherer who would not starve, even if my clothes grow thin, and I can't find much to say for myself other than I am still here tugging at her sleeve. Um, would you like, um, hmm. These are such strange times, Katerina, with the disease and also with the social unrest in our country. A, a true reckoning is at hand, I think. Uh, I keep coming back. I'm doing a lot of reading, as I know you are. Um, and I came across this uh, quotation from uh, W.S. Merwin, who sadly has been taken from us in recent years. Uh, but he says this, I think there's a kind of desperate hope built into poetry now that one really wants, hopelessly perhaps, to save the world. One is trying to say everything that can be said for the things that one loves while there is still time. And I find myself coming back to that. I, it's, it, it's difficult to write about the things that are going on right now. It's so easy at least for me, to get on a soapbox to sort of scream and cuss and yell. And I don't know that that does a whole lot. And yet at the same time, I feel like Merwin does, that I, I some, somehow, have to, somehow have to bear witness to what's happening. Um, I've got a recent poem about the pandemic, if you would permit me. Sounds yes. wonderful. Yeah. Okay, good. It's called We... We bought masks, gloves, soaps, wipes, wore hats, long sleeves. We studied and read and scrolled and listened and wept. We kept scrolling. We balled our fists. We cussed. We moaned. We schemed. We planned. We wept. We skipped that meeting, then this one, skipped church, skipped the races, skipped the concert, skipped the bar, did not skip the light fantastic. We forswore cash and raided the empty shelves. We did curbside, we ordered in, and we learned the names of the UPS man, the FedEx woman, the post person. We kept scrolling, we kept weeping. We watched the minutes, the hours, the days, the weeks, the months. We literally watched time fly and stop several times, a day, every day. We wept, we kept scrolling, we watched the maps, we memorized symptoms, we got swabbed, we took vitamins, we ate our greens, our oranges, we took our temps, we examined our shit, we wrote, we called, we zoomed, we traded real for virtual, we traded people for memes, we traded money for memes, we traded thought for memes, we memed for memes. We kept scrolling. We forgot to weep. 
We shut the windows. We closed the doors. We locked the doors. We pulled the shades. We grew long hair. We canceled work. We canceled play. We quit shaving our faces, our legs. We quit this world and entered a new one. We went for walks on the other side of the street. We went for walks around the yard. We went for walks upstairs and down. We walked around the room. We sat, we scrolled, we wept once more. Then we didn't. We were lost at sea, lost in the mirrors, lost on the screen, lost in the memes, lost in our very own homes with no breadcrumbs to find our ways out or in. We watched the memes dissolve. We watched our screens go blank. We watched the keys change to pebbles. We watched ourselves turn away, turn away from each other, turn and weep into our so very clean hands. Wow, Mark. I don't know if I can say anything else. We're all doing what we can. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been able to write about that. Yes, yeah. sure. Well, I think it's... <laughs> The, this one came to me. I think it's good yeah. to exercise caution with certain themes. Um, but that's about the isolation and the loneliness, which to me has been one of the really bad disease that we've been plagued with. And then now we have all the excuses to be even more isolated, to be even more alone, to be even more afraid of each other. Yes. So now it's encouraged. Now it's considered good taste. Yeah. yeah. It's very complicated. Yeah, very complicated. And then it is, uh, what is it to survive? What are we to carry forward? Yeah. It refocuses mm -hmm. our priorities, I should hope. Yeah, yeah. I wish it would do so as a as a uh, as a nation. With our very clean hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. I mean, it sounds like a, a a book title. Very clean hands. <laughs> well, I have to keep that in mind. I will keep that in mind. Yeah. And so, what is your new manuscript about? Uh, I don't think it's about anything. They're just. Um, scattered scattered poems uh, i uh, i usually collect you know a hundred poems and begin to whittle them down and see if there are any connections i look for the connections from poem to poem more than i do for a for a particular theme it may be a failing of mine but i i don't seem to be able to write to theme very well i just rather have the very best poems i can and and uh, when i put them together hope that they they read with a certain kind of, not that they're connected, again, not that they're connected thematically, but that one poem leads to the next in a way that isn't disruptive. Um, this isn't quite the same, but I think of your own, um, your volume, uh, Second Skin, I, I love the way that you uh, interrupted those longer narrative pieces with those very sort of short, succinct pieces. It gave them a room to breathe, and I, I like that kind of uh, gesture in a book-length collection of poetry. And, and although I don't know that I break it up by length so much, I still like to have room to breathe between certain poems and, and certain other ones. So to answer your question, I don't know what I will find as I begin to put this collection together, but uh, that's part of the fun of putting together a new book, is just seeing how the uh, the 50 or 60 poems will fit with each other. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what I heard you say is like, I got a volume of work. I have to figure out what are the best ones and then how they fit together. Yes. And yes, exactly. uh, these are the ABCs of uh, making poetry books, in my opinion. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, it's been pleasure talking to you, Mark. Good luck oh. with your writing of children books and adult poetry books. And I wish for myself and for the listeners of Accents that in not too distant future, you're back on our show and you're talking about your two new published books. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much. I look forward to it. Thank you.